There's a force sweeping this country, leaving a path of ash and destruction in its wake. The fire is causing all this smoke. It's really nasty, Brent. The great American wildfire can go from a single lightning strike to an emergency evacuation in merely hours. So you have to link weather to fire behavior. You've heard the stories of people losing their homes. You've seen the video of neighbors barely escaping with their lives. These are the rarely told stories of the firefighters themselves. This is Firestorm. Hello, I'm Dave Malkoff. All throughout the United States, from Florida to California, wildfires are getting much bigger. The fire seasons are lasting longer. In the 70s, there was a wildfire season lasting about five months. These days, it's seven months or longer. Back in the 80s, the western U.S. had about 140 large wildfires per year. By the 90s, it had grown to 160 per year. More recently, it's about 250 large wildfires every year. And wildfires are expensive. The USDA says the 2017 U.S. wildfire season cost a record $2 billion. It's on par with hurricanes and, and winter systems and the impact that it has across all areas. So how do firefighters get in front of all this, going from an initial attack to containment? You got really down in there, that's what we need. The most dramatic tool they use is outfitted with two wings pushed by tens of thousands of pounds of thrust. Okay, thanks buddy, load return. Thrills from the battlefronts brought before your eyes. American pilots have been fighting fire from the sky since they came back from fighting World War II. I'll go ahead and turn inside the fire here. Am I cleared down? You're cleared down to uh, 5,100 if you got me in sight. I've got you. Okay, I'm going to go around here now. Okay. Go ahead. Let me... About 15. And you're cleared to drop. That is f***ing nasty. It's really nasty, Brent. Today's tankers can carry nearly 20,000 gallons of water over a hot zone. So here's how it normally works. There's fire on a ridge, ground crews radio in they need a little help, and then air support pilots come flying in low and slow on a plane. Or, okay, okay, here we go, here as we, go. we saw firsthand in Florida, a giant helicopter. That is really something to see the water spraying you in the face as this dual rotor Chinook is pulling up water from this country lake. Also, the fire is causing all this smoke in the background. It's one thing to stand underneath it all or see it on TV. But who's actually up there flying these things? Where do they come from? On a California runway, we met Captain Dilbert Hunt, who flies for Ericsson Aerotank. It's been an interesting transition from the old days to the new days. What is, what's the difference? The difference is the type of machinery, the, the speed at which these things go. It, however, to me, I've been doing it for so long that it's just kind of second nature. Captain Hunt's been doing this for nearly 30 years. So this is your bird here? This is it here, yes. The 87. There's a big tank inside of it, holds 4,000 gallons. It's amazing to see it up close like this. Yeah, it's a big airplane. And then the gravity feeds into this tank here and then out the door. So Can we, we push see that? Yep, come on. But before we could step on board, Hold on a second here. Tanker 103 was needed on the front lines. We're going to go too. Okay. All right. It takes a minute to fire up those two big turbofan engines, so we had a few seconds to sneak on board. That's basically in the center of the airplane. Turns out Tanker 103 isn't so different from some of the planes you have been on. That is, if they ripped out rows 10 through 18 and placed a heavy firefighting tank right in the middle of the plane. So you guys are all taking off right now? We're going to go right now. Think about that. 30 years fighting fires. Three decades in that captain's chair above the firestorm. It's one of those careers that's more of a lifestyle than a job. These planes save families on the ground. Drop three tankers. But the families who are on board? 
I'm an air tanker pilot. I consider myself to be a firefighter just like anybody else. They end up missing out on a lot. Uh, my name is Brian Baker, and I'm a air tanker captain for Colson Aviation, uh, flying this lucky C-130 air tanker right now. Fly that airplane. I've got a five-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, and a 13-year-old. One You're gone for how much of the year? Um, nine months. Nine months yeah. out of 12 months. In 2011, I did 297 days straight. I, I was home four days and 297 days. Dun, dun, dun. So this is it. This plane is most of his life. For a decade and a half, Brian has been flying over American fires. Then he replaces the stickers on his plane and then puts out Australian fires. That red stuff you see coming out of planes is usually a brand name flame retardant called Foscheck. Inside Brian's tank, there is 4,000 gallons, 36,000 pounds. And what does the Foscheck actually do? Hey, I'll show you. You see, there's probably some here in this bucket. So there's that dry piece of brush. Oh, wow. So that's what it looks like when we drop on it. So here's here's the uncoated so the flames can get it, and then here's the uh, the retardant coating it and basically insulating it from, from the fire. They're not trying to put out a fire with that red stuff. They're just trying to stop it from spreading further. The red goop slows down the roaring path of destruction. The only way to stop a wildfire is to take the fuel away from it. Just imagine a big red marker, and we're drawing lines around the fire with the red marker, and then that slows the fire down or stops it from moving any farther forward. It's basically gum thick and water. It's got stuff in it to keep the moisture from evaporating. When it falls out of the airplane, the, it just holds everything together so it can hit the ground. If you had a lighter and put it right here, it'll just sit there and smoke. It won't light on fire. It cools because it's mostly water. It literally retards fire spread by causing the phase of the fire to go from flaming combustion to smoldering combustion. In other words, it's still burning and it cools it down, but it smolders. So a smoldering fire travels a lot slower than a flaming fire. We can lay retardant down all day long, but unless we get ground forces in to back it up, it's gonna burn through the retardant and keep going. It just takes time. I do everything that I do for, you know, for the people and, and property owners that we're trying to save. There's 18-year-old kids that are out there swinging tools through the brush in 110-degree weather. And because I know that uh, the faster we get there and the better the job that we do, the less work those guys are gonna have to do. I fought fire on the ground when I was younger, and that's, that's why we do this, to go out there and help those guys. The same time Brian and his fellow pilots are taking care of the crews on the ground, there's always someone very far away taking care of the kids. How do you, how do you take a picture on here? The older they get, the tougher it's getting for me to be gone these long durations of time. It's really, really getting tough. We worry constantly while he's flying on fires. Dad's not here to protect us. The safety of our children is on me, and I've had many sleepless nights. Firefighters are among the world's true heroes, putting themselves in the middle of unpredictable danger that could come roaring their way as fast as wind can change direction. They do this all for you, for strangers risking their lives to save people they will most likely never meet. Well, it's time you met them. These are the true life dramas of the men and women in the middle of a wind-driven firestorm. It's not good. Yeah. I'm not so happy I'm standing here right now. Each and every one of these firefighters has a life they put on hold when they spend months running into burning forests. We've already met the captain of this firefighting plane, Brian Baker. 
most of his days are spent here and not at home with his family. You're gone for how much of the year? Nine months. Nine months yeah. out of 12 months. In 2011, I did 297 days straight. I, I was home four days and 297 days. It's hard to keep up when you're by yourself. Brian's wife, Tara, is nearly 500 miles away. We're at the easy part of the day now. She's managing a home with three kids pretty much by herself. I love you. This is Major. He's our fire season baby. Young Major was not only born during the fire season when dad's away, but they were also moving into this farmhouse in tiny Anderson, California, population less than 10,000. Tara did it all without her husband. The move, the boxes, the transition to a new life. This probably wasn't a great idea at the time with a newborn baby and him being gone, but you know, if he can get a better schedule, then it will be okay. When I did this before I had kids, it was, you know, I missed my wife and I missed being home, but I mean, I've dreamt about flying air tankers ever since I was knee high to a nose wheel, so it was, that was my life. And now there's things in my life that are more important than air tankers, so it may, it's, it's getting, the older they get, the tougher it's getting for me to be gone these long durations of time. It's really, really getting tough. Many people realize this is the reality for single parents and military parents, but it's easy to forget that this struggle is happening all over the country more and more as large armies of firefighting crews are out on longer and longer deployments nationwide. I think, how long was Brian home? For like two weeks? Yeah. He was home for two weeks and he left to go get back on the tanker because we had him. July 30th. Everybody at my house understands what I'm out here doing. And they But sometimes it's hard for little kids. Oh, it's to horribly yeah. hard. Yeah, especially especially for my son. You know, he's 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 the worst one. He when I they, my, my wife dropped me off at the airport in Sacramento to come get this airplane. You know, I got out of the car and he just lost it because he put his hands up and I, I'm like ah, I I kissed him on the forehead and I told my wife I got I I can't hear that. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> It's really a universal feeling. Parents around the world want their home to be a beautiful, safe place for their children to land. But when dad's at work, many aspects of their life are left up in the air as well. It gets lonely and it's, it's hard, you know, because you do everything on your own. The families are the ones that suffer. They're the ones that are home without their dad there. My daughter, uh, I'm not going to be there for her fifth birthday. And my son's younger. My son's a year and a half. And he's walking and talking and putting words together. And, and I'm missing all of it. There are days when grandma's here to help out, but it's not every day. It sucks, but. It's all you've known. Well. Since you've met her. Yeah, it's. It's all your children know. Yes. That, that too. Here's the hard reality. It's a dangerous job. According to one industry analysis, more than 62,000 firefighters were injured on the job in 2016 alone. When a wildfire breaks out, often local firehouses will get the call as well. Everyone gets pulled in for the big ones. All firefighters spend large amounts of time away from their loved ones. Yeah, I have three kids. Yeah. They're growing up pretty fast, right? and gone and they're doing all these things. I miss graduations, I miss birthdays, I miss all kinds of stuff. You know, the tough ones are weddings, things that you can't duplicate. But thank goodness for her FaceTime. Um, you know, she's not just hearing my voice, she can see me and everything, so, so it's been good. I'm sure it's tough at home. Where are the diapers? I'll go grab one, they're upstairs. I'll get it. It's hard to explain why, why dad's gone and why dad's leaving, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to not be there. What do I need to do before I leave? I feel like I'm forgetting something. These days without dad are more than just a fast-moving string of errands. OK. Are we ready? <coughs> Tara has to pick up the middle schooler. Let's go get Daisy. Bye. We'll see you Monday. She has to quickly go shopping, then do another pickup at the high school. Jake gets done with basketball at 5. And by the time she gets home, it's dark outside. When we hear scary noises in the middle of the night, Dad's not here to protect us. The safety of our children is on me. 
and I've had many sleepless nights. We worry constantly while he's flying on fires, but try not to let anyone know how scary it really is waiting for that. I just landed text from him. Get back! Go! 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 When a fence breaks, a toilet breaks, or a car breaks down, we have to figure these things out, sometimes on our own. My wife was a firefighter for CAL FIRE too, so she understands. She gets it, she, you know, she understands that this is a lifestyle that we both accepted and chose. And see, I've got to figure out how I'm going to fix this. I don't know what I'm doing either. So. Yeah, well, no, that's what I'm saying is like, I don't build fences, I don't freaking know. I've hid alone in the bathroom many times, bawling my eyes out. Being the wife of a tanker pilot is by far the hardest job I've ever had. they're going to come home and and it just it just sucks it's going to get better the more pilots you train the less you have to be the, out on yep, the, road. the less i have to be out on the road i love brian and i knew soon as i met him that he was the one for me so oh, for me i i'm willing to live the you know this lifestyle for him until they train more captains and then he can come home more. We're about to take you to the front lines. We've got fire right over here. Just last night, this hillside was roaring in flames. It still is at this point outside of La Conchita, California, the biggest fire in California history. We're here with Cal Fire crews as the Thomas Fire burned more than 440 square miles, taking out more than a thousand structures. So how does a fire grow that big? Turns out it's much more complicated than what Smokey the Bear always told us. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Fire spreads on an almost microscopic level. Tiny little crispy edges of plants get superheated by hairdryer like winds long before they burst into flames. What the wind does is it pushes the heat coming off of the flames downwind and it preheats and pre dries the fuel in front of the fire, making the ignition easier and faster. If little particles or branches or twigs or leaves break loose from the vegetation that's burning, they can fly downwind and start spot fire, so the fire basically leaps over itself. Jumping around and over the heads of firefighters who have to climb large hills to get to the next patch of fire. This way? Oh, over here? Oh. Wow. We haven't even started walking up this hill just yet. Look at how easily this dirt pushes away when you grab onto it with your foot or with your hand. And we've got fire right over here too. This is dangerous work. So I just climbed up that hill. I didn't have any equipment on me at all. Right. Well, yeah, the average about 45, 50 pounds is what we carry. So basically essentials, food, water, radios, extra batteries. We're trying to get as much of this done before any weather changes. We pick a point where we think it's safe to make an attack where you know we won't get burned around and we go up the sides together kind of until we can get to the other end and pinch it off. Here in California, firefighters have help from minimum security inmates. They're the ones in the orange jumpsuits. Each inmate has volunteered to do this after a rigorous training program. They all work together to get a hose up here to spray the flames down with water. But their main goal is to get ahead of the fire. We want to stop the fire at that line. The only way to stop a fire from spreading is to physically dig a line in the ground. You stop its advance. You see grass, trees, bushes, they'll all burn. But if you cut that away and leave a dirt trench, you stop the flames. That's what it means when you hear people talking about a fire being 50% contained. That means half of the fire is burning inside the line they cut around it. Firefighters use bulldozers, shovels, chainsaws, whatever they can haul up the hill to cut that line. 
It's a real race against time. You may have noticed that some of these firefighters and inmates have gasoline cans attached to their shovels. That's not for setting a backfire. This is to power the chainsaws. Just a few ridges away, we ran into another potentially dangerous situation. This is and avocados. Yep, it's all avocado, so the rancher here, this is how they make their living. This ranch has been on fire all night. Is there any way that this could spark up again? 30 minutes ago when that wind sparked up, this whole canyon disappeared. If you take a look down here, you'll notice the trees are planted into wood chips. The fire is actually underneath, smoldering like a giant barbecue. As I assigned an engine to go up on that road where the water tender is, and they're gonna cut a line straight down this hill. So what happens when the engine can't get there when the fire is too deep off the trail? Firefighters parachute in from above, chainsaws and all. We're gonna take you flying with the smoke jumpers. They jump out of planes and land right next to the fire. That's coming up. Across the nation, wildfires are burning hotter and longer than they have in the past. People are moving closer to the woods, building homes right in the potential burn zone. Tree-eating bugs are leaving behind ghost forests. Put that all together and you get the ingredients for a perfect firestorm. We are hiking right into the largest wildfire in California history, the Thomas Fire. Some 8,500 firefighters were out on this one. With fires burning from coast to coast, Four nine, John Spot. Everybody's on the ground, okay? there has been a sharp rise in demand for a special kind of firefighter. Oh, perfect. Nice. Nice, Josh. The kind that jumps out of a plane with a tent hidden under their custom-built Kevlar fire suit. That's our job. <laughs> <laughs> Firefighters who fly into danger like superheroes. They call them the smoke jumpers. We flew up to Boise, Idaho to meet the smoke jumpers where they train and work. This is our loft and this is where all the parachutes get rigged. We can be pretty much anywhere in the West in a couple hours. Like everyone else here, Martha Shoppy spent years driving and hiking into fire. These days, she has a quicker way to get to work. Away. So how does the parachute actually work? Do you have a backup parachute there that if the one doesn't work, you can deploy another one? We only have four seconds before our parachute opens, so yeah. we don't have that time of free fall. And then if something's wrong with that one for some reason, then we have a reserve parachute on the front. Yeah, your second guy was getting out, out there a ways, but totally fine with this amount of light wind. They were on the ground in less than six minutes. And once they land, they could be fighting a fire in the middle of nowhere for up to three weeks. In the world of firefighting, they are essentially SEAL Team 6. Might want to put that door strap on because you're going to have to run to the front here. Not only are they top-tier firefighters, they have to know how to build and fly an aircraft made out of fabric and strings. Boise dispatch, jump 4-1 on national. Just getting the chance to become a rookie smoke jumper is off the charts difficult, but making it through the first few weeks is some next level stuff. It's a matter of not getting sick, not getting hurt, learning all of the skills and learning them quickly. There's a smoke jumper base here in Idaho and there's another one up in Alaska where forest fires can get so big, this one state can burn more acres in one year than the rest of the country combined. Really fortunate to be here. A lot of people want to be smoke jumpers, I know. 
Some areas are just so remote that there's no other way but parachute for firefighters to make their way in. I spent a month in Alaska and it definitely made a lot of sense. I mean, most people move around by plane or boat. To get a sense of what it's like to be a smoke jumper, we went up to Alaska as well. Chance of precip, pretty low over most of the state. The day starts with a custom weather report from the meteorologist. As the smoke jumpers get their plane ready, Get a little cozier here? Yeah. Yeah, you bet. We're heading up on a plane of our own, an old Aero Commander. This is the spotter plane. From here, we can see if there's fire below. And look, there's one right now. So we call back to the jump shack, tell them this is not a drill, and the smoke jumpers take off, ready to soar into the fire zone. This is dangerous work, no matter what you're doing. If it's the real thing here in Alaska or an exercise down in Idaho, you're still jumping out of a plane. This is crepe paper like you would get yep. at the hobby stores. Yeah. You reduce that risk by taking this low-tech yet highly accurate approach to reading the hyperlocal weather. They start throwing streamers that simulate us going through the air to see what the winds are doing. We were standing right underneath, and those streamers floated straight down into the trees. That means there's not a lot of wind today. Up in the noisy plain, it can be a long ride from the jump shack to the jump site. What are you thinking about during that time when you just don't have that location yet? A lot of us take that time to just sit and think about jump procedures, emergency procedures what they need to do, what can go wrong. They may even be thinking about their families they don't get to see that much. Yeah, there's a lot of people here with families. Most smoke jumpers are on duty for six months out of the year. I don't have kids, I'm not married, so for me it's a little bit easier. After several low passes, it's jump time. 3,000 feet down. It's a close community. We're, we're taking care of each other. Once you can see those red, white, and blue canopies deploy, just seconds after they jump out, they don't have any free fall time. They're just jumping and pulling. Perfect landing. Oh. <laughs> How was that? That was a nice downwind. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like when we, uh, when we don't have a whole lot of a lot of wind. Yeah, yeah, so, so nothing's pushing you around nothing's or anything? Nothing's pushing us yeah. around. Watch out for this guy. Well, oh, here, here he comes. On an actual smoke jump like this, these things come together quick. The firefighters wake up not even knowing if they'll be jumping that day. On a training mission, 60 to 90 firefighters will jump out of that open door. Things happen fast for them as well. They normally hit the ground pretty quick, rolling the landing. And then the cargo comes down right after that? That's chainsaws and all the gear that you need to... Uh, food and water and about two, yeah. two to three shifts. Yeah. When we jump out, like, our mission is to get a good parachute over our head and get to the ground as quickly as possible. And then the next one should be the yellow one. That should be Martha. Watch. OK, that's that's her. That's her coming down. Oh, it's a little off. That was a little far back in the tree. It's not exactly sure where she went. You all right, Martha? OK. Turns out Martha got caught in an updraft. Roll back the tape for a second there. You can see she was stuck in the sky. He was going up and down a little bit. Yeah, um, I was kind of sitting at about 500 feet and not dropping. It was a little bit of up air at the bottom. So I had to be a little more aggressive with trying to get to the ground. So that's where it ends up being a little rocky. Hey, jump four nine, hold up jumpers. As she was trying to get her parachute out of the tree. Sometimes we have to climb the tree and get it out. Oh my god, yeah. in addition to fighting a fire. Yeah, people are running down there. Something was happening behind us. Copy, hold up jumpers. Something everyone prepares for, but never wants. Yeah, we got a potential injury over here. One firefighter came down hard, despite all the protective gear they're wearing. This has hockey pads in the hips and thighs, and then we have knee pads as well. We have a 35-year-old male 
He's uh, stable. His vital signs are stable. Uh, he's packaged and ready, uh, awaiting transport by life flight. Martha's friend left here on a stretcher. The rest of training day was canceled. It took him two months to fully recover from a back injury. See, I told you, it's a dangerous job. And then there's the dangers that you wouldn't even know about unless you've spent time as a wildland firefighter. A widow maker, this thing right here, a killer tree. It's a tree that can burn on the inside without any flames or smoke that's visible. That story after this. Welcome back to a very steep, very hard to walk down hillside as I go right under here in Southern California. There's a lot to wildland firefighting people don't know unless they come out here and meet the fire crews right in the middle of the firestorm. Big wildfires can temporarily turn sections of our planet into hellscapes. They create their own wind by pushing hot air up and sucking new air in from just outside the fire line. As a fire grows, it chews through the oxygen in the air and the vegetation on the ground. Predicting weather around wildfire is an extremely complicated science. Step a few acres this way, one kind of weather. On the next ridge, something completely different. And here's how weird it gets. Right here is something known as a fire nado, a fire tornado, or a fire whirl. At up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit and spinning rapidly, this flaming twister is what happens when a burning core and a rotating pocket of air meet up. They have been clocked at nearly 100 miles an hour and can rocket 50 feet up into the sky. Avoiding crazy fire weather is the goal. There may be hundreds, if not thousands, of firefighters on the front lines. What you don't always see is the team working remotely back at base, like the incident meteorologist. Yeah, we have pictures of meteorologists on horseback. Keith Hockenberry showed us how weather experts did his job about 100 years ago when the only way to get weather conditions was to ride into the fire, take rudimentary readings, and report back over telegraph, one beep at a time. These days, there are high-resolution satellites that can look down at a fire from space and feed back information to the meteorologist on the ground with second-by-second -second updates. It's all coordinated from this secure facility in Idaho called the National Interagency Fire Center, NIFSI for short. When people need stuff, uh, there's a limited amount, so NIFSI prioritizes things. And it's based on weather, it's based on availability, it's based on what's out there. NIFSI's handling fires from coast to coast. Each team on the ground needs not just a meteorologist, but another kind of specialized expert called a fire behavior analyst. What I do is I evaluate the fuels that are burning, the weather that we're under, and the terrain, and try and make an estimate of what the fire's gonna do the next day, the next week. They almost all the time run uphill. They almost all the time run downwind. Almost all the time burn with uh, pretty high intensity. While we consider anything above three miles an hour to be extremely dangerous rate of spread, only three miles an hour, that's as fast as a person can walk. Anything faster than that is what we consider dangerous. The trick is, is you have to link weather to fire behavior. And that's the kind of technology they're chasing down right now. In the coming decade, meteorologists hope to have a computer that will take weather data in and spit out what the fire will do, a kind of destruction forecast. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, with a chance of towering, swirling flames. I mean, if it's a 50-foot flame length, it's a whole different ball game than a, th a three-foot. Some of the greatest dangers are hidden away. There's a fire in Shellville, and it's going straight up the middle of a tree. 
This is an extreme example of what some people call a killer tree, one that's burning on the inside. This one caught on camera during the 2017 Tubbs fire had these glowing windows where you could see the danger inside the trunk. Most killer trees aren't so bold. They keep their internal fire hidden away until they crack in half and fall on somebody, leading firefighters to have an even more morbid name for these. They refer to them as widow makers. So it's burning from the inside it's burning out? the inside out, yes. Um, you'll notice that the smoke is coming up the side there, and so you can tell that this, it's probably burning clear up into here. We caught up with a CAL FIRE crew who had just seconds ago found and cut down a potential widow maker. When we established that there's a widow maker, we'll wrap the uh, area around the tree. We'll look, try to guess the distance of how tall the tree is, and then go one and a half times the distance and flag it off all the way around. Let me show you what's happening. Down in the swamps of Florida and Georgia, fire can play tricks that frankly sound impossible. If it starts burning in the trees, the fire will get down into the root system and cook there like a fuse for a year or more. Imagine that. The fire you thought was over and done with last year can rise from the grave like a zombie and start up again next year. The same fire. Well, there's oxygen in the soil, and it can keep smoldering for a long time sometimes. If you get fire in a swamp, for example, it can last a year and a half. And that fire started a year ago or a year and a half ago? Fire might have started from a few lightning strikes a year ago. Doesn't that blow your mind? It did before, and now it's kind of, yeah, OK. It's routine for you now. Yeah, it's in the swamp. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. It's going to be a long-term event. In the swamp or in the desert brush, fire will find a way to hide out and keep burning. These large-scale firefighting operations are getting more sophisticated every day. And today, our team won the battle, at least on this hillside. But the clock is always ticking. All it takes is a burst of sunlight or a strong gust of wind, and that hillside will go up in flames. Still ahead, what is driving these longer, more destructive fire seasons? When Firestorm continues, we ask the experts. Welcome back. We are on the front lines of a wildland firefight here in the state of California. Wildfires are burning basically all year from coast to coast in this country. What has changed in the past few years? The trend appears to be more large-scale fires, longer, warmer summers, which generally will equate to longer fire seasons and probably larger fire seasons. We have spent the last hour crisscrossing this country from Florida to Colorado. But definitely a lot of different weather patterns that I've noticed. From Alaska to Idaho. Talking to the heroes who jump into it all, swinging chainsaws and fire hose whenever duty calls. But lately, they're all working overtime. Why is that? Let's start with the meteorologist who works the fire line. Well, the demand for weather services has just gone up. In the last 20 years, the agency in charge of fighting large-scale wildfires has had to double the amount of meteorologists they have working nationwide. The length of fire seasons that we've been happening, uh, have been seeing, they've been longer. Back in the early 2000s, you would get six, seven months, and now we're, we're lucky to get a couple of months of break before we send out the next on-site meteorologist now. I feel like the fire season has extended. It starts earlier sometimes. Is, the, is it climate change, uh, possibly? Here's what we know for sure. The planet is warming quickly. The overall global temperature is warmer now than it has been in the past thousand years and likely longer. Greenhouse gases are trapping more heat than ever. We know this because the ice in the Arctic holds little bubbles of the Earth's atmosphere going back hundreds of thousands of years. It's all creating hotter areas, longer droughts, more fuel for big wildfires. But it's not just the planet getting warmer, it's us 
getting bolder. We are building homes right next to the woods, even deep in the canyons where fires begin. There's more people moving into the wildland that we have to worry about. That's a big change it, itself. It is a huge change. I think that's a big part of it. It's a problem known as the wildland urban interface, where cities creep into potential fire zones. In the 20 years between 1990 and 2010, this area grew by 46 million acres. People like living in the wilderness, but the danger is real. Adding nearly 13 million homes in the danger zone is a risk that has turned deadly time and time again. I'm standing here. I'm going to hold her like this. We're good. Let's get her out of here. Things will burn hotter. The fires will be more aggressive. The tactics will have to be changed in order to combat those fires. Longer seasons inherently mean more extreme fire behavior. And then there's the war on bugs. Tiny bark beetles the size of a grain of rice did this. Millions of dead trees from New Mexico to Canada have been weakened by drought, allowing the bugs to take over and eat them alive. Now they're just sitting here dead and ready to burn. Among this seemingly never-ending landscape of blackness, we found a breath of purple right on the edge. Uh, this is called fireweed. It's one of the first plants to return after a devastating wildfire. Where nature destroys, it also breathes new life. Like it or not, fire is natural. In fact, some pine trees have cones that are completely coated in a resin that will only release the seeds after that resin is melted away by fire. One kind of wildfire or another has been sweeping across this planet since it formed. What has changed is us. The more people you move into a drought-stricken zone, more likely you are to spark a disaster. And then if you have a wind gusting to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, and then you get an ignition, whether it's a car fire or power lines down, that's a perfect scenario for a big fire. More, more people being out there means more you know, people cause fires. Whether it starts by lightning or something else, it's the people you have met who are driven to put their personal lives on hold to contain the firestorm.